Okay, so we've developed an understanding of the requirements for aromaticity, which include uninterrupted cyclic conjugation, and as part of that, uh, we need to have planarity, and then the, there is this magic number of electrons, uh, which is the 4n plus 2 pi electrons um, in that conjugated system. So that gives us aromaticity. What we just found out in the last lecture is that uh, the the sort of opposite uh, number of electrons, so just 4n pi electrons, uh, actually leads to uh, very unstable situations, uh, something that is termed anti-aromaticity. And so we can come up with a set of uh, requirements for anti-aromaticity as well. They actually turn out to be identical to aromaticity. So in order for a molecule to be anti-aromatic, it also needs to be an uninterrupted cyclic conjugation. If we don't have that, we, we have a non-aromatic. Um, it also needs to be planar, so again, that's tied into the cyclic conjugation. If it's not planar, it's not conjugated. And then we need this, um, what we might call an unmagic number of electrons. Okay, so we need 4n pi electrons um, in order to have anti-aromaticity, which thus equates to 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. Uh, pi electrons. So we have these three requirements met, we have an anti-aromatic system. Now, it turns out that this term uh, and really this concept of anti-aromaticity was actually coined by Professor Ron Breslow uh, here at Columbia. Um, and so there's actually been a very deep history in terms of studying uh, aromaticity and anti-aromaticity um, right here at this institution. Okay, so anti-aromaticity uh, is characterized um, by very high reactivity. So we have aromaticity equated with stability and low reactivity anti-aromaticity is just the opposite, very highly reactive species. Um, so for example, we could look at cyclobutadiene. Uh, this actually is so reactive that it wasn't even ever prepared until 1965, uh, despite a lot of effort. Uh, and in fact, it requires very low temperatures uh, to even isolate this thing for a while. If you warm it up even a bit, even to the point of um, minus 78 degrees, so uh, carbon dioxide is a solid at this temperature, um, cyclobutadiene will very uh, quickly dimerize. Okay, so it does not want to exist um, because it's uh, anti-aromatic. Now, in fact, uh, it isn't even anti-aromatic. Anti-aromaticity is such a, an unfavorable situation um, that cyclobutadiene uh, really doesn't want to exist um, in this uh, anti-aromatic form. So here's just a, a sort of a, a small synopsis of the molecular orbital uh, picture that we would expect for cyclobutadiene, where we've got that one lowest molecular orbital and then the degenerate pair with the unpaired electrons. This is such a bad situation that in fact what cyclobutadiene does is it distorts itself. It, it, uh, it changes um, the, the length of, of two of its bonds so that it can feel a bit more like it has isolated alkenes as opposed to the cycloconjugation. So it, it can have a molecular orbital picture that's a bit more like you would expect for um, a, a non-conjugated uh, set of alkenes. And so that's how much uh, the molecule wants to avoid this very unfavorable situation. <clears throat> In fact, this is a general principle that molecules will basically do anything they can to avoid anti-aromaticity. Right? It's, it's an energetic penalty. They do not want to exist in a form that makes them uh, anti-aromatic. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of times what they will do is uh, try to break the conjugation um, by rotating some bonds if they're flexible enough. Um, and so we've already uh, seen one example where this can happen. Um, so we've uh, learned about cyclooctetetrine. And so uh, now you understand that if this was a planar, fully conjugated system, we would have eight electrons, and that's an anti-aromatic number. So this would actually be anti-aromatic if it was planar. And that's exactly why it is not planar. It, it has enough flexibility that it can uh, adopt this sort of uh, tub um, shape, okay? And since now these uh, pi systems are no longer conjugated, um, it doesn't uh, fulfill the requirements for anti-aromaticity. and so. Uh, cyclooctetetrine is not aromatic and it's not anti-aromatic. In fact, it's non-aromatic, okay, because it doesn't have cyclic conjugation, all right? And here's just a simple um, 
sort of a three-dimensional representation of, of cyclooctatetrine, um, where you can uh, pretty clearly see the tub shape that we've got um, going on. This is, this is certainly not a planar system. <clears throat> and in fact, cyclooctatetrine is commercially available. Um, it's used uh, somewhat regularly in uh, organic chemistry. Um, and so it's just a reagent. It certainly isn't uh, like cyclobutadiene, uh, which is very, very reactive. Okay, so <clears throat> this is an important set of um, ideas then uh, that we uh, can, can apply in terms of aromaticity and anti-aromaticity. So aromaticity, again, is an energetically very favorable situation. And so the stability that a molecule gains by aromaticity um, can actually override many other energetically unfavorable circumstances. Okay, so if a molecule can um, adopt the criteria for being aromatic, that's uh, oftentimes going to override other criteria that would tend to make the molecule unstable. For example, um, things like angle strain or charge. Now, usually these things are unfavorable and a molecule is, is going to um, either uh, you know, adopt a confirmation um, or react to avoid those situations. But in many circumstances, if they can adopt angle strain or adopt charge that leads to aromaticity, um, they will do so because the overall um, energetic um, accounting actually works out in favor because of the, the deep stability of aromaticity. As part of that, molecules will very often, um, or, or, or will planarize, they will become planar um, to adopt that complete cyclic conjugation to achieve aromaticity. So something, you know, this is sort of just restating this, this statement here, um, just in terms of the, the actual shape of the molecule. Um, but very often you will see that a molecule will become planar, um, even though the bond angles might be really quite horrendous, um, and they will, the molecules will do so because it gives them aromaticity. So this great energetic benefit. Um, Molecules will also um, react if they can uh, achieve aromaticity. So here's just one uh, example that shows up quite a lot. So if ever you have a six-membered ring uh, with, with two alkenes, right, and then a, uh, a carbonyl, this is a ketone, um, this actually will very quickly isomerize. So the proton at the adjacent carbon will migrate to the oxygen, and then that pair of electrons will... Uh, will fill the gap here, um, and you'll get to an aromatic ring. And it does that uh, because it can achieve the deep energetic stability of aromaticity, right? So this is an exceedingly favorable process. And basically, uh, except in very special circumstances, you cannot isolate or usually even observe this type of, um, of situation. Um, and in fact, what you, what you see quite regularly are uh, these types of molecules, which, um, as we learned in the first video, are called phenols. Okay, so, so reactions that um, result in aromaticity are usually going to be very, very favorable. This is something that's going to be important for us in the next section. By the same token, anti-aromaticity is something to be avoided at all costs, right? So molecules will uh, do whatever they can um, uh, to, to avoid anti-aromaticity, um, or if they can't, as in the case of cyclobutadiene, um, except for that, that distortion thing that they do, um, they're going to be so reactive that they basically can't be isolated. Okay? And so what this means actually is, you know, to, to a first approximation, anti-aromaticity is something that basically doesn't exist. I mean, that's not completely true, but um, there needs to be extremely uh, special circumstances in order to override the energetic penalty of anti-aromaticity. Okay, it's such um, a, an unfavorable situation that, that basically we don't observe it. Okay, and so the better way to think about anti-aromaticity is not uh, something that that real-world molecules are going to possess usually. Instead, what it is is a is a roadblock. It's a roadblock for what molecules do not want to do or to be, okay? And so this uh, will, of course, um, be in terms of structures that we won't expect to see, such as uh, planar cyclooctatetrine 
or cyclobutadienes. We won't expect to see those, but also in terms of transition states. We talked earlier about how aromatic transition states um, are going to oftentimes be very favorable. Okay? And for the same reason, if we have transition states that are anti-aromatic in character, those are going to be very unfavorable, and so we won't expect to see those. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to move on and look at some circumstances um, outside of the, the typical benzenes where, we, where aromaticity um, allows us to, to see some pretty interesting species.